welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. I don't know how aware you are of what's going on in Iran, so let me just bring you guys up to speed. Um, this week, three freedom protesters uh, who have been accused and convicted of murdering a uh, paramil paramilitary uh, police officer from the besiege. Those are the people who uh, kill protesters. Anyway, they're accused of killing a, a besiege officer in November in Isfahan. Uh, their names are Masaj Kazemi, Saeed Yakubi, and Salah Mir Hashemi. Uh, so Kazemi, Yakubi, and Mir Hashemi, and they're supposed to be executed this week for murder. And the only basis of their convictions is their torture-induced confession. And in fact, one of the three had a taped conversation on the phone from prison with his girlfriend where he told her that the uh, confession uh, was induced by torture and that they were completely innocent. Um, Iran has executed, according to The Guardian, it's probably more than this, even The Guardian acknowledges, uh, since the end of last month, they've uh, had 60 executions that they've uh, performed and admitted. Um, and uh, so these three young men are supposed to be killed. Uh, people of Isfahan are trying to save them. Uh, people rushed the prison in the town uh, yesterday to try to uh, save them, to prevent them from being executed. And we're just going to have to see how this plays out in Iran. Um, we talked in past weeks about uh, the strikes that are going on in Iran, about the return of the anti-hijab protests and um, the anti-regime protests. The teachers union in Iran that uh, was calling for a strike and demanding that they stop religious indoctrination in schools, which means that they're asking for a regime change. Um, at any rate, all of these things happening in Iran. But in the meantime, in Geneva, uh, the UN Human Rights Council just appointed Iran, which is a member of the Human Rights Council of, of, uh, of uh, the United Nations, to serve as the head of the what is it called? The Social Forum of the Human Rights Council. And the year 2013 has been designated by the United States, by the United Nations Human Rights Council as the year of technology and human rights. And as Hillel Neuer from UN Watch in uh, Geneva uh, noted on Twitter, and you guys should all follow Hillel Neuer on Twitter if you haven't already, um, Iran just hanged Yusuf Mehrad and Sadrola Fazizer for using social media to criticize religion. So these two young men were murdered for using social media to criticize religion. They were executed by the regime for that crime. And as far as the UN is concerned, Iran, as a member of its Human Rights Council, is the appropriate country to appoint to be the head of their social forum that's supposed to advance human rights through social media. It doesn't get much better than that, but let's just go on a little bit. Um, so among the people that Iran has executed over the past couple of months, there's a German national, there's a Swedish national, the Swedes is, uh, uh, I got, I'm getting this information from a Guardian article, which is sort of interesting that they're publishing it, but the Guardian reported that um, Ireland there's a, a one of the people under arrest and who was sentenced actually to six years in prison for anti-regime whatever um, is a, a dual Irish French national and the Irish reportedly or allegedly were able to get the Iranians to free their national or their dual national by agreeing to designate the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the terrorist organization that's responsible for the regime, for killing the Iranian people, um, and for exporting terrorism throughout the world, um, the Irish government has agreed to designate the IRGC as an anti-terrorist force. Right, and in exchange, they're letting out the Irish French hostage that they sentenced to six years in prison for opposing a regime that sentenced him to six years in prison uh, for nothing. So, um, 
I think that the the report, the allegation against Ireland and Ireland wouldn't respond to questions from The Guardian about whether or not they, they agreed to designate the IRGC, the largest uh, terrorist organization in the world, um, as an anti-terrorist force. They wouldn't respond to The Guardian's query about whether they had done that or not. Um, but I think that what we see here is a sharp edge of what's called the Red-Green Alliance. And I think that it's very important to notice this Red-Green Alliance. Uh, this week, uh, on May 15th, we're recording this on May 15th, so I think it's actually today, uh, the UN is supposed to carry out, for the first time ever, the General Assembly, a conference to commemorate the Nakba, that is the catastrophe which is Israel's establishment. And as Israel's UN ambassador, Gilad Erdan noted, I mean, this is opposed to the UN's charter. Israel is a member of the UN, and uh, is, the United Nations passed the uh, partition of Resolution 181 in, in 1947, calling for the establishment of the Jewish state and the Palestinian Arab state, which never was formed because the Palestinians just wanted to annihilate the Jewish state, not establish their own state and side. By the way, that, that still is the case 75 years later. But now... 75 years later, the UN isn't celebrating at least one country's establishment that was foreseen by the resolution uh, 181 from 1947. Rather, they're having an entire uh, ceremony to bemoan the establishment of the state of Israel as a catastrophe. So um, why are they doing this? Well, it goes back to the Red-Green Alliance. And so we saw here with the Irish agreement, alleged agreement, to designate the IRGC as an anti-terrorist force, the hard edge of this, which is if you don't cooperate with us, if you don't carry our water, if you don't lie about us and pretend uh, th that lies are true by designating the largest terrorist organization in the world as an anti-terrorist force, then we're going to kill your citizen. We're not going to let him out, and who knows what's going to happen to him. Look, we just happened to kill a Swedish guy uh, last week, and we'll, we'll kill your guy next week, no problem. So this is extortion. That's the sharp edge of the Red-Green Alliance. But usually they don't need to stoop to these kinds of actions in order to uh, receive the obedience and the partnership that they need, that they require, that they demand, because the, the left, the... The left in the United States and increasingly, unfortunately, here in Israel and also um, the the countries of Europe have embraced a narrative about themselves as, uh, as Europeans, as Christians or post-Christians, which is anti-European, anti-Christian, they're very anti-American, and they're very anti-Semitic. And so they... Uh, of their own volition are with the green side of the alliance, the Islamic side of the alliance, because they're acting out of conviction. They do believe that theirs is the side that's in the wrong and that the Muslims are the side that's in the right, or at least parts of their side, specifically and first and foremost, the Jews and, and then second, the Americans. Um, and that if they part company with the Jews, if they attack the Jews, if they join in the Nakba day, uh, event at the UN and say that one of their fellow UN member states uh, is a cata it, the fact that it exists, let alone is a member of the UN, is a catastrophe, then they're going to get off. Then they're not going to get in trouble. Then, or they are on the right side of justice together with the jihadists um, because they both hate the Jews together. They both hate the Americans together and or Europe together, and they're going to march together lockstep because they want to advance a common creed of hatred of Western civilization through Europe or anti-Americanism, and first and foremost, and always and under all consider all conditions, Jew hatred. So, you know, and and if those inducements of that shared creed of hatred aren't sufficient, then okay, then we're going to seize your nationals and we're going to kill them or we're going to carry out terrorism on your soil until you cry uncle and then you're going to go along with us. So it's that mindset that stands at the heart of the left's embrace of jihadists 
And we saw it with Christina Manpour, among other members of the International Press Corps, who were very quick to find any way to try to attack Israel for defending itself against Islamic Jihad's latest onslaught against Israel, the rockets and the missiles and the mortars that they shot off 1,200 in under a week at Israel. And they're, of course, supposed to be the little guy in Gaza fighting and uh, Hamas's uh, much more powerful enemy, supposedly. Um, so this is this is uh, her way of of abiding by her side of the bargain. And the Red Green Alliance is to again attack the Jews, attack Israel, uh, pretend that the people who are trying, who are using indiscriminate force to attack Israeli civilians, are not war criminals. Even though by the letter of international law, which by the way the UN is supposed to be sort of the, the home of, right, um, indiscriminate attacks against civilian targets any time that they occur, they're a separate war crime, which means that Islamic Jihad sent 1,200 mortars, rockets, and missiles against Israel. Each one of those separate attacks was a separate war crime. But rather than excoriate and condemn uh, Islamic Jihad for carrying out repeatedly, multiple times a day, war crimes, separate and, and discreet war crimes. Christina Munpour and her colleagues and comrades on the red uh, side of the Red Green Alliance attacked Israel and its uh, and its representatives and um, and and its military in their reports in their interviews uh, during the course of the last round of fighting. So um, I think. You know, when we look at how Israel is supposed to fight in this situation where you have a consortium of, of jihadist organizations run through Tehran by the largest terrorist organization in the world, which is the Islamic regime, and its Praetorian Guard is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, when you have them on the one hand attacking us with wanton force, and by the way, my, my interview this week is Major General Gershon Cohen, and we're going to talk about the nature of the war that they fight, what stands behind their determination to fight Israel, and how Israel has to look at the challenge of fighting them and what it needs in order to survive. So that's a separate discussion. But when, we, when we're looking at this, and you should really watch it, um, when we're looking at this system that's arrayed against us from the Islamic side, and we see that its complement in the West is the red side, which is saying that Israel doesn't have any legitimacy. Its very establishment is the UN General Assembly uh, 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 established or, or, or proclaimed uh, on May 15th was a catastrophe. It was a Nakba. Um, how, how, are we, how are we supposed to navigate uh, these waters? How are we supposed to look at, at this at at this combined effort by the Greens and by the Reds to, on the one hand, attack and destroy Israel physically, and on the other hand, destroy Israel by demonizing it and by saying that it has no right to exist, let alone to defend itself and to seize from it uh, and, and, and to subvert its own society uh, by peeling off enough Israelis to stop believing in the justice of their cause and to make common cause with at least the left side of the red-green alliance. Um, and so I think, you know, part of the answer is what we saw last week in the way that Israel attacked Islamic Jihad. We've talked about this in previous shows as well, that, you know, we're not going to go into Gaza today uh, when they have automatic replacement for all of their weapons and that's one last little parenthetical thing i'll say as soon as the ceasefire went into force israel started resupplying gaza with with uh with gas and and electricity and all the rest of it so that israel's actually supplying and we're required to do so by the international community by the red side of the alliance we're supplying them with the means to replenish their missile stores um and to replenish their war machine which all they are is a war machine against us um by by their comrades on the left and so we playing by the rules we went in and did it so what did we accomplish last week i think what one of the things that we accomplished was we showed um that uh is that we attacked uh very important targets 
targets that were very important for Islamic Jihad, and we caused them real losses. The fact that we took out um, three of their top uh, terror masters in, in our opening volley in the game, it sent a very clear message to Hamas, it sent a very clear message to Hezbollah that we can do this to you as well. That was extremely important, and it also made it much more difficult for Islamic Jihad to operate on the ground against us, even though you might not have noticed that with the amount of weapons that they, they with the amount of uh, attacks that they went against us. And then the other thing that we have to understand is um, that we were able to attack them without getting sucked into a wider conflict, which was really important because that brings us back to Iran. Iran, as I've said, and I'll continue to say repeatedly because it's really important that we all understand, Iran is the epicenter of it all. And if we want to long survive without going in with our full force and retaking Gaza and retaking South Lebanon and all the rest of it, the way to do it is through helping the Iranian people, helping the people of Isfahan who are rushing the prison in Isfahan to overthrow the regime. This is something that you know, we have to give them money for their strikes so that they don't starve to death if they go on strike. We have to make sure that they have satellite coverage for internet so that they can communicate with one another because the regime keeps blocking them from doing so. And 101 other things that Israel can do that the whole, that every citizen of the world can do, can help, can get out the information as far as possible on your own Facebook pages, on your Twitter feeds, on your, in your own social networks. Let people know the names of the Iranian who are being killed by the regime. Every day, again, this week, it's Majid Kazemi Saeed Yaqubi Saleh Mir Hashemi. They're about to be killed for seeking freedom. People have to be able to know that these are real people with families, with girlfriends, with, with mothers and fathers, and they're being murdered by the regime in Tehran that is exporting terrorism against Israel, against the United States, against all the free countries of the world, as far away as Australia and into Europe, obviously, South America, Argentina, uh, and on and on and on. And this is the main force that we have to deal with. This is the force that is blocking the freedom of the Iranian people and that is threatening Israel and the rest of the free world. And if we can take, take a, a, not even a, if we can keep pointing out the evil of this regime and what they're doing and help the people of Iran to destabilize and overthrow it, it'll be much more, it'll be a much simpler question of how to contend with Islamic Jihad, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Bashar Assad in Syria. And all of the and the Houthis in Yemen and on and on and on. The most the the central focus of our effort has to be the malign, the malignant regime in Tehran that is killing the Iranian people, that is being celebrated by the red side of the red green alliance. Look, they're being they're being they're being advanced at the given leadership role at the UN Human Rights Council. What a crock! What a disgrace. And we have to disgrace the UN for doing this. We have to disgrace the UN for holding a Nakba event. We have to disgrace everybody who thinks that the establishment of a Jewish state in the Jewish homeland was a catastrophe because it's a disgraceful position to take. It's anti Semitic and it's also anti human rights. It's anti everything, freedom. It's anti everything that the Reds claim to care about. And we have to be able to call things, as I've said before, by their names, what they are. Israel is facing a red-green alliance. Western civilization, I would argue, since 9-11 at a, at a minimum has been facing the same alliance, and we have to expose it. We have to, we have to try to, as much as possible, isolate each side from the other, and we have to go after the regime in Tehran every day, every day. Anyway, those are my thoughts for this week, and um, and uh, share them. Make sure you subscribe to this show, that you subscribe to my my openings, and uh, then you click on the next. We're doing it separate now because it's long, so we're just doing my 
openings, which is really just my my thoughts for the week, and then uh, moving to my interview with my guest in a separate um, film. So watch what uh, Garishana Cohen says this week, uh, General Garishana Cohen, and what we talk about there. Set it all out, and don't forget Iran. That's the main thing. That's the target. We have to take down this regime, and then we can worry about the rest of it. Have a great day.